Our call to worship this Lord's Day is taken from Psalm 34, verses 1 through 4. I will bless the Lord at all times. His praise shall continually be in my mouth. My soul shall make her boast in the Lord. The humble shall hear thereof and be glad. O oh, magnify the Lord with me, and let us exalt his name together. I sought the Lord, and he heard me, and delivered me from all my fears. Let us stand together. We do exalt thee, our God and our Savior. We lift up thy most holy name. We bring unto thee the worship which thou hast ordained. Purify our hearts, O God, that we may offer to thee sacrifices that are acceptable and mediated through the Lord Jesus Christ. We ask our Lord that thou would meet with us, that thou would walk in our midst, and, O oh God, thou would search our hearts and try our thoughts and see if there be any wicked way in us and lead us in the way everlasting. Let the words of our mouth and the meditation of our heart be acceptable in thy sight, O oh Lord, our strength and our Redeemer. In the name of Jesus we pray. Amen. Amen. Let us take our Psalters and turn to Psalm 102, the second version. We'll be singing verses 1 through 7. I think we can all identify with the psalmist here uh, in verses 3 and 4. Uh, my days like smoke consume away, and as in hearth my bones do burn. My heart is wounded very sore and withered like grass doth fade. And yet the Lord calls us, even when we feel that way, uh, to cast all of our cares upon him. Even when that's true, as we see at the very end in verse 7 uh, of this portion of the psalm we're singing upon the houses top I watch and so that is again even in those times of trial are you watching are you watching for the mercies of God are you watching are you looking for hope in the Lord even in those times of darkness that will come into all of our lives and uh, that I think is what the psalmist is is teaching us Upon the house's top I watch. We'll be using the tune Rockingham. Dun 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 dun. <clears throat> Lord, hear my prayer and let my cry. Lord, hear my prayer. And let my cry have speedy access unto thee. Have speedy access unto thee. In day of my calamity. In day of my Calamity. Oh, hide not thou thy face from me. Oh, hide not thou thy face from me. Here when I call to thee that day. Here when I call. To thee that day, and answer speedily return. And answer speedily return. My days like smoke consume away. 
And as in hearth my bones do burn. And as in hearth my bones do burn. My heart is wounded very sore. My heart is wounded very sore. And withered like grass doth fade. And withered like grass doth fade. I am forgetful, grown therefore. I am forgetful, grown therefore. To take and eat my daily bread. To take and eat my daily bread. By reason of my smart within. By reason of my smart within. And voice of my most grievous groans. And voice of my most grievous groans. My flesh consumed is my skin. My flesh consumed is my skin. All parched doth cleave unto my bones. All parched doth cleave unto my bones. The pelican of wilderness. The pelican of wilderness. The owl in desert I do match. The owl in desert I do match. And sparrow-like companionless. And sparrow-like companionless. Upon the house's top I watch. Upon the house's top I watch. Our Old Testament scripture reading this Lord's Day is taken from Nahum chapter 3. <clears throat> we continue uh, in this chapter. Uh, the prophet relates the devastation that will befall Nineveh. Uh, and uh, I think the devastation is especially grievous because they had a prophet in their midst. And they repented uh, as, as, a, uh, as a city. Uh, they repented of their sin before God and uh, have backslidden now back as God's judgment is heavy upon them and it makes us uh, ourselves think very carefully uh, how much more we deserve as a nation the judgment of God uh, we not only have had a prophet for a few days we have had the Word of God for hundreds of years um, uh, in our midst 
preached from pulpits and yet we have become a bloody city we have become an idolatry idolatrous a city and nation and uh, god's judgment deservedly rests upon us and uh, we see i think god's judgment in many many ways the wicked leaders we have the wicked laws that are enacted the threat of war uh in wars in other parts of the country the threat of nuclear war um and calamities and catastrophes god is certainly uh, showing forth uh, his anger his wrath uh, for our many sins but do we hear as a nation are we listening or are we going on uh, in utter rebellion against the lord our god uh, we need to pray that this nation would do as none of it did at one time and repent of its many sins and turn in faith to jesus christ Woe to the bloody city. It is all full of lies and robbery. The prey departeth not. The noise of a whip and the noise of the rattling of the wheels and of the prancing horses and of the jumping chariots. The horseman lifteth up both the bright sword and the glittering spear. And there is a multitude of slain and a great number of carcasses. And there is none end of their corpses. They stumble upon their corpses. Because of the multitude of the whoredoms of the well-favored harlot, the mistress of witchcrafts that selleth nations through her whoredoms and families through her witchcrafts. Behold, I am against thee, saith the Lord of hosts, and I will discover thy skirts upon thy face. And I will show the nations thy nakedness and the kingdoms thy shame. And I will cast abominable filth upon thee and make thee vile. And I will set thee as a gazing stock. And it shall come to pass that all they that look upon thee shall flee from thee and say, Nineveh is laid waste. Who will bemoan her? Whence? shall i seek comforters for thee art thou better than populous no that was situate among the rivers that had the waters round about it whose rampart was the sea and her wall was from the sea ethiopia and egypt were her strength and it was infinite put and lubing were thy helpers yet was she carried away she went into captivity her young children also were dashed in pieces at the top of all the streets and they cast lots for her honorable men and her great men were bound in chains thou also shalt be drunken thou shalt be hid thou also shalt seek strength because of the enemy all thy strongholds shall be like fig trees with the first ripe figs if they be shaken they shall even fall into the mouth of the eater behold thy people in the midst of thee are women the gates of thy land shall be set wide open unto thine enemies the fire shall devour thy bars draw thee waters for the siege Fortify thy strongholds, go into clay and tread the mortar and make strong the brick kiln. There shall the fire devour thee, the sword shall cut thee off and it shall eat thee up like the canker worm. Make thyself many as the canker worm. <clears throat> make thyself many as the locusts. Thou hast multiplied thy merchants above the stars of heaven. The canker worm spoileth and flieth away. Thy crowned are as the locusts, and thy captains as the great grasshoppers, which camp in the hedges in the cold day. But when the sun ariseth, they flee away, and their place is not known where they are. 
Thy shepherds slumber, O king of Assyria. Thy nobles shall dwell in the dust. Thy people is scattered upon the mountains, and no man gathereth them. There is no healing of thy bruise. Thy wound is grievous. All that hear the ruit of thee shall clap the hands over thee. For upon whom hath not thy wickedness passed continually? Let us stand together as God's people as we come to the Lord in prayer. We praise thee, our, our great God and Savior. We praise thee for thou art an unchangeable God. Thou art infinite in thy, uh, in thy nature and being. Thou art infinite, O Lord, in thy power, wisdom, holiness, justice, goodness, and truth. We honor thee, our Lord, and bring before thee this day our worship. For thou art a great and mighty God, and there is none like unto thee. There is none other. O oh Lord, we, we honor thee, we exalt thee, we praise thee, our Lord, for the greatness of thy works in creation and providence, in salvation, and even in thy judgment, O oh Lord. We bless thy most holy name that thou hast appointed thine only begotten Son to be the mediator. We praise thee, our Lord, that he has come to this earth to rescue and save sinners chosen in Christ Jesus before the world began. We bless thy most holy name that thou hast sent forth thy Holy Spirit, O Lord, as that portion from thee, O God, who has bestowed upon us the glorious inheritance that is ours in Jesus Christ, that that uh, none can rob and steal, that will not fade away, that is forever reserved for us in the glories of heaven. Our Lord, we praise thee that there is forgiveness with thee. And if thou would, O oh God, mark iniquities, who could stand? We praise thee, our Lord, that, that thou art a God who remembers not our sins against us as we come to thee through Christ. As those, O Lord, who have been forgiven, we now freely come. As thine own adopted children, we who have been justified by faith alone, in Christ alone, we flee unto thee. We do not walk. We do not ramble. We flee into thy presence, for therein is safety and security. Therein, O God, is help and salvation. Thou art our, for our fortress. Thou art our defense. Thou art the rock, the immovable rock upon which our life is built and shall never be shaken from that firm foundation of salvation. We pray, our Father, that thou would forgive us of our sins as we confess them unto thee. For, Father, we have feared man, we have feared circumstances more than, than we have feared thee. We ask our Lord, have mercy upon us. We have taken thy name in vain. O oh Lord, in broken covenants, promises, vows, oaths, we have not kept, O oh Lord, our word. Have mercy upon us, O oh Lord, for we have looked to others to make us happy rather than to thee uh, for the joy of the Lord. For the joy of the Lord is indeed our strength. Our God, we ask that thou would forgive us for our many inconsistencies and hypocrisies that exist between our profession and our practice. Pretending as if thou dost not see us when we are all alone, acting as though, O Lord, uh, we can flee from thee when we sin against thee. Lord, we pray that thou would grant to us uh, thy forgiveness for such sins. Lord, have mercy upon us for our lukewarm love and our weak faith. Build us up, O Lord. Strengthen us in our resolve to follow thee. Cause us, our Lord, as thou hast loved us, O Lord, to show forth that love in our hearts by way of our devotion to thee, our loyalty to thee, by way of our obedience 
uh, to thy holy commandments. Our Lord, we pray that thou would forgive us for not resting <clears throat> in thy care, in thy promises, in thy faithfulness to all generations when we must go through trials. We ask our Lord as well, forgive us for our stubbornness and our resistance, O oh Lord, to thy loving correction and rebuke in our lives. And Lord, even at times, though loving, very severe, but oh God, may we not run, may we not harden our hearts to thy correction, whether it come, O oh Lord, through uh, the word of God we have read, the word of God that is preached, whether it come from a husband, a wife, a child, or a parent, whether it come, O oh Lord, from a brother or sister in Christ, may we not harden our hearts, callous our ears, O oh God. Soften us, O oh Lord. Make us those that are pliable, who are easily easy to be entreated by thy word. Forgive us, our Lord, for our defensiveness and our uh, uh, the fact that we are overly sensitive and easily offended, O oh God. May we, Father, uh, develop uh, and grow thick skin, but, but very tender hearts. We pray, pray, Father, forgive us for our irregular uh, private worship, our irregular family worship. May it, O oh God, uh, uh, become regular, and may its regularity, O oh Lord, not lead us to mere formality and going through the motions, but may our regularity and worship, O oh God, uh, uh, break our hearts before Thee. May it cause us to be humble before Thee. May we seek out the living God, commune with the living God who has created us and who has rescued and saved us. We pray our Father forgive us for not improving our baptism, not reflecting upon, O oh God, the promises made to us in our baptism, and, and uh, not only reflecting upon them, believing them. Not only believing them, but, O oh God, living our lives in light of them. We ask our Father forgive us for our lust of the flesh, Forgive us for our worldliness and, and grasping and holding on so tightly to the things of this world that we cannot let go of them. Uh, Lord, uh, may there not be a tug of war in our lives. The world pulling us one direction and, and thou, our God, pulling us another direction. May we let go of the world. May we serve thee with all of our heart, soul, mind, and strength, we pray. And though being in the world, may we not be of the world. Though necessarily using the things that are in this world uh, that thou hast given unto us uh, to promote thy kingdom and for our own necessities, may, O oh God, we not worship the things in this world. We ask our Lord that thou would forgive us for uh, sporting with temptation, flirting with temptation, Cause us, our Lord, to hate even the appearance of sin and to flee from it. We pray, our Father, hear our confession. Deliver us from our sins. Draw us unto our Savior even now. We praise Thee for the gospel of Jesus Christ, for that free grace and mercy to us through the life and the death and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Even uh, today, every Lord's Day, we celebrate Dear God, the resurrection of our Savior, it is the Lord's day, and we humble ourselves before Thee this day in worshiping Thee. Forgive us and cleanse us, O Lord, and grant to us assurance in Christ Jesus that our sins are indeed forgiven. We ask our Father <clears throat> that Thou would look upon our families with mercy, Lord, that uh, we would uh, show love, that we would seek peace. The Lord, we would strive harder for peace than we do to be right. Uh, uh, when there is a difference of opinion, certainly the truth of Jesus Christ should reign in our families, but at times, oh Lord, we, we simply 
are uh, wanting to be right uh, and wanting, oh God, to, uh, to have what it is that uh, we want uh, more than to seek peace. We're willing, oh God, to set stumbling blocks before one another rather than to remove every possible obstacle that thou dost not command and yet, and yet uh, that which uh, causes dissension and contention within our families. Oh Lord, uh, so often we are more troublemakers than peacemakers within our family. We pray, Father, that thou would forgive us, that thou would lead us in the paths of righteousness and truth. We pray, Father, for thy church, have mercy upon her and heal the many divisions. Bring peace and reconciliation, Lord, in that uh, uh, biblical doctrine, worship, and church government. Tear down the walls and the barriers that man has erected in dividing thy people one from another in various church courts and various denominations and sects rather than, O oh God, clinging to, uh, Lord, uh, that faithful testimony in terms of communion that have been passed on to us by our faithful forefathers and have, O oh Lord, uh, as well been bound by solemn covenant. We pray our Father, uh, bind thy church together, heal the many bruises, heal, heal O oh God, the many uh, divisions uh, the many ways that we have offended one another. We pray our Father, uh, hear our prayers, raise up faithful gospel officers, the Lord in our midst. We pray our Father that thou would establish and settle, O oh Lord, faithful presbyteries, faithful uh, synods, O oh God, uh, that will, will again adhere to that which is biblical, but that which is also uh, a confessional and in, in agreement, O Lord, with Thy Word of God, uh, with the Word of God. We plead with Thee, our Lord, that Thou would uh, heal uh, this nation of its of its uh, uh, cancerous rebellion against Thee, O God. Uh, it spreads and it continues to spread its hatred for Thee, as we see it more and more rampant and in uh, government as we see it more and more rampant in schools and various organizations uh, lord uh, uh, we pray that thou would uh, cause those who uh, are christians and who stand for the true gospel of jesus christ O oh lord to be those who who speak forth the truth who are not ashamed for what we have been granted and given in thy word, that thou, Lord, would, would cause us to be those who promote reformation uh, by way of our uh, earnest and sincere prayers for this nation, for the nations of this world, O oh God, to turn into Christ, to turn from their sin, to receive the gospel uh, and redemption offered through Jesus Christ. We plead with thee, our Lord, that thou would grant that uh, the, the wicked leaders and the wicked laws that presently rule uh, in this nation might be smitten, that they might be removed. That thou would give unto us, O Lord, not because we deserve it, but because thou art merciful. Give us, O Lord, righteous and godly leaders. Grant to us, O God, that righteous laws that are in agreement with the law of God would be established. We pray that the magistrates would be the ministers of God to, uh, to thy church for good. And uh, that Lord, uh, those that are wicked and those, O oh Lord, who rebel against thee would incur the wrath of the magistrate. We ask and plead with thee, our Lord, that Jesus Christ might reign in all nations, that he would show forth, O oh, O oh Lord, uh, his mighty power, his authority, uh, which transcends national boundaries and encompasses the whole earth, for he is the prince of the kings of the earth, the king of kings and lord of lords, and that, that the Lord Jesus would show forth his dominion by way of judging the nations, that he would show forth his power 
as king by drawing the nations into the visible church of Jesus Christ. And that uh, uh, even uh, thine ancient people, Israel, would likewise be brought uh, into <clears throat> the visible church of Jesus Christ. Lord God, we pray that thou would have mercy upon those who are ill, particularly, Lord, those who are chronically ill, those who have chronic pain, oh God, that, be, that become so numbing, uh, oh Lord, uh, uh, in the mind. And, and uh, uh, we pray, our Lord, that thou would grant to them comfort today, encourage their hearts, oh Lord, that, oh Lord, this life is indeed uh, passing away. Thou art a God who promises the healing of these bodies, whether now, at this time, or in, or at the time of the resurrection, they will be conformed to the, uh, to the body of the Lord Jesus Christ. May we look beyond whatever trials we're going through, whatever discouragements we face now, may we look, O oh God, uh, unto the glories that are prepared for us in heaven. We plead with thee, our Lord, that uh, even with the, the many conflicts, the many adversities, the many disagreements that we have, even within, with other with, uh, fellow Christians, Lord, that we would look beyond, that we would see our God, that there is coming a time when all of these, praise God, will be ended. And when we, our Lord, will dwell in fellowship, blessed fellowship and peace forever and ever with our brethren. O oh God, hasten the day and give to us, O oh God, such a foretaste of that now that we would seek peace with all of our hearts, that we would, Lord, seek uh, reconciliation. O oh God, we would pursue it. We would chase it and run after it. O oh Lord, we plead with you. Have mercy upon us, our, our God. Uh, be with those, O oh Lord, who are in need of work, looking for work in, in order to meet the needs that they have for their families. We pray, Father, that thou would supply all their need according to thy riches and glory by Christ Jesus. We pray, our Father, that thou would be with those traveling, have mercy upon them, bless them, our God, as, as, they, uh, as they are traveling, uh, granting them protection, uh, safety, O oh Lord, uh, in, in all of their journeys. We plead with thee, our Lord, that, that thou, our God, would be with those that we have testified the gospel of salvation unto, that, Lord, thou would draw them unto thyself and gifted them new hearts to receive the blessed gospel of Jesus Christ. We ask our Father as well that thou would uh, be with those who are faithful witnesses standing for the truth regardless, O oh God, of, of the persecution that comes against them. That God, thou would grant to them continued confidence in thee and boldness. May we, our Lord, continue to uphold them. We pray, Father, and thank thee for answered prayer that thou art a God who, who does continue to invite us into the throne room of grace. And we come, O oh God, even now uh, to, to offer to thee uh, our prayers. And Lord, to know uh, that thou dost answer prayers that are brought to thee through Jesus Christ as mediator. And Father, thou dost delight in our prayers. It is not uh, a burden to thee to hear us call upon thee however many times in the course of the day we may do so, but thou dost delight in every prayer that comes to thee as our Father. We pray, our Lord, that we, uh, as thy children, would continue, uh, Lord, to approach thee and to bring these prayers, whether it is a, a wait, whether it is a no, whether it is a yes, thou dost answer prayer, and we fall upon thee, for thou art all wise in knowing what we need every moment of this day. We ask our Lord, cause thy word to burn in our hearts, to burn the chaff, O oh Lord, to purify our hearts and our minds, 
and our consciences from Lord, the remnants of sin that that plague us. But our God, we would offer unto Thee now uh, our lives as living sacrifices, that Thou, our Lord, would grant to us ears to hear what the Spirit says unto the church. Our God, we would be humbled before Thee. We plead with Thee, our Lord, that Thou would receive now our worship and bless thy word is, is, as it is read and as it is preached to the glory of Jesus Christ, in whose name we pray. Amen. Our New Testament scripture reading this Lord's Day is taken from Mark chapter 6. We have a biographical sketch in this early part of the chapter between two men, uh, Herod the coward and John the Baptist the brave heart. Uh, Herod, who would not do what was right because it would look, he would look weak in front of his friends if he were to do what was right. Whereas John the Baptist didn't care. He was willing to stand for the truth even if it meant him going to prison, even if it meant him having his head severed from his body. There's a brave heart. May God grant us the grace to be brave hearts for Jesus Christ, not cowards. And he went out from thence and came into his own country, and his disciples followed him. And when the Sabbath day was come, he began to teach in the synagogue, and many hearing him were astonished, saying, From whence hath this man these things? And what wisdom is this which is given unto him, that even such mighty works are wrought by his hands? Is not this the carpenter, the son of Mary, the brother of James and Joseph, and of Judah and Simon? And are not his sisters here with us? And they were offended at him. But Jesus said unto them, A prophet is not without honor, but in his own country, and among his own kin, and in his own house. And he could there do no mighty work, save that he laid his hands upon a few sick folk and healed them. And he marveled because of their unbelief. And he went round about the villages teaching. And he called unto him the twelve, and began to send them forth by two and two, and gave them power over unclean spirits, and commanded them that they should take nothing for their journey, save a staff only, no scrip, no bread, no money in their purse, but be shod with sandals, and not put on two coats, and he said unto them, In what place soever ye enter into an house, there abide till ye depart from that place. And whosoever shall not receive you, nor hear you, when ye depart thence, shake off the dust under your feet for a testimony against them. Verily I say unto you, It shall be more tolerable for Sodom and Gomorrah in the day of judgment than for that city. And they went out and preached that men should repent. And they cast out many devils and anointed with oil many that were sick and healed them. And King Herod heard of him, for his name was spread abroad. And he said that John the Baptist was risen from the dead, and therefore mighty works do show forth themselves in him. Others said that it is Elias, and others said that it is a prophet, or as one of the prophets. But when Herod heard thereof, he said, It is John whom I beheaded. He is risen from the dead. For Herod himself had sent forth and laid hold upon John, and bound him in prison for Herodias' sake, 
his brother Philip's wife, for he had married her. For John had said unto Herod, It is not lawful for thee to have thy brother's wife. Therefore Herodias had a quarrel against him and would, not, and would have killed him, but she could not. For Herod feared John, knowing that he was a just man and, and holy, and observed him. And when he heard him, he did many things and heard him gladly. And when a convenient day was come that Herod on his birthday made a supper to his lords, high captains, and chief estates of Galilee. And when the daughter of the said Herodias came in and danced, and pleased Herod and them that sat with him. The king said unto the damsel, Ask of me whatsoever thou wilt, and I will give it thee. And he sware unto her, Whatsoever thou shalt ask of me, I will give it thee unto the half of my kingdom. And she went forth and said unto her mother, What shall I ask? And she said, The head of John the Baptist. And she came in straightway with haste unto the king and asked, saying, I will that thou give me by and by in a charger the head of John the Baptist. And the king was exceeding sorry, yet for his oath's sake and for their sakes which sat with him, he would not reject her. And immediately the king sent an executioner and commanded his head to be brought. And he went and beheaded him in the prison and brought his head in a charger and gave it to the damsel and the damsel gave it to her mother and when his disciples heard of it they came and took up his corpse and laid it in a tomb and the apostles gathered themselves together unto Jesus and told him all things both what they had done and what they had taught and he said unto them Come ye yourselves apart into a desert place and rest a while. For there were many coming and going, and they had no leisure so much as to eat. And they departed into a desert place by ship privately. And the people saw them departing, and many knew him, and ran afoot thither out of all cities, and out went them, and came together unto him. And Jesus, when he came out, saw much people and was moved with compassion toward them because they were as sheep not having a shepherd. And he began to teach them many things. And when the day was now far spent, his disciples came unto him and said, This is a desert place, and now the time is far past. Send them away that they may go into the country round about and into the villages and buy themselves bread, for they have nothing to eat. He answered and said unto them, Give ye them to eat. And they said unto him, Shall we go and buy two hundred pennyworth of bread and give them to eat? He saith unto them, How many loaves have ye? Go and see. And when they knew, they say five, and two fishes. And he commanded them to make all sit down by companies upon the green grass. And they sat down in ranks by hundreds and by fifties. And when he had taken the five loaves and the two fishes, he looked up to heaven and blessed and break the loaves and gave them to his disciples and set to set before them. And the two fishes divided he among them all. And they did all eat and were filled. And they took up 12 baskets full of the fragments and of the fishes. And they that did eat of the loaves were about 5,000 men. And straightway he constrained his disciples to get into the ship and to go to the other side before unto Bethsaida, while he sent away the people. And when he had sent them away, he departed into a mountain to pray. And when even was come, the ship was in the midst of the sea, and he alone on the land. And he saw them toiling in rowing, 
for the wind was contrary unto them. And about the fourth watch of the night he cometh unto them, walking upon the sea, and would have passed by them. But when they saw him walking upon the sea, they supposed it had been a spirit, and cried out. For they all saw him, and were troubled. And immediately he talked with them, and saith unto them, Be of good cheer, it is I, be not afraid. And he went up unto them into the ship, and the wind ceased, and they were sore amazed in themselves beyond measure, and wondered. For they considered not the miracle of the loaves, for their heart was hardened. And when they had passed over, they came into the land of Gennesaret, and drew to the shore. And when they were come out of the ship, straightway they knew him and ran through that whole region round about and began to carry about in beds those that were sick, where they heard he was. And whithersoever he entered into villages or cities or country, they laid the sick in the streets and besought him that they might touch if it were but the border of his garment. And as many as touched him were made whole. Please turn with me in your Bibles to our text for this Lord's Day, as it's found in Acts chapter 15, verses 36 through 41. <clears throat> And some days after Paul said unto Barnabas, Let us go again and visit our brethren in every city where we have preached the word of the Lord and see how they do. And Barnabas determined to take with them John, whose surname was Mark. But Paul thought not good to take him with them, who departed from them from Pamphylia, and went not with them to the work. And the contention was so sharp between them that they departed asunder, one from the other. And so Barnabas took Mark and sailed unto Cyprus. And Paul chose Silas and departed, being recommended by the brethren unto the grace of God. And he went through Syria and Cilicia, confirming the churches. Personal disagreements will inevitably come in any and all relationships, whether in a marriage between a husband and a wife, whether at work uh, between fellow employees, uh, or whether in the church between brothers and sisters in Christ. These disagreements may at times become so heated over matters that are not even clear violations of God's law. Dear ones, our goal as Christians should be to live as much as possible at peace with those around us, at least on our parts, seeking to remove all obstacles that lead to heated disagreements at home in the church, and at work. The Apostle Paul tells us in Romans 12, 18, this is, this is our calling, Durans, with regard to peace. If it be possible, as much as lieth in you, live peaceably with all men. As much as lieth within you. You're not responsible whether someone else chooses not to live in peace, but as much as lieth in you, it should be your goal to live in peace. 
You see, there was a, a, a home, a home where nearly every decision that is made is a hill upon which you are willing to die is a home that will be filled with constant battles and conflicts and little peace within it. Beloved, I'm not minimizing at all the decisions we must make. Decisions that have very important and serious consequences must be those that are prayerfully and carefully made. But even at such times, it is, uh, it is unnecessary to throw angry, cutting words that will only damage or destroy a relationship. Just consider some of the heated arguments you have had, that I have had, in your home and in my home, over unnecessary and trivial matters. The color of paint that we should use on a wall in a bedroom. Why are we willing to damage a relationship and trample upon peace in our home, in the church, or at work over such decisions that are made? Is it because I must be always right? Is it because I must show that I'm in control? Is it because I must show how intelligent I am? Dear ones, how important is it to you to maintain as much peace and order in your relationships as possible, especially with fellow Christians. Relationships that are constantly filled with tension, over heated disagreements, are relationships that are fighting for control in one way or another, rather than fighting for peace. If we would fight as hard in prayer to have peace with one another and remove those landmines in our marriages that damage our relationships as we fight over so many unnecessary disagreements, we would see Christ's work in a mighty way. We certainly can never compromise when it comes to obedience to the commandments of the Lord. For example, we cannot compromise in sanctifying the Lord's day. It is holy to him in all of the commandments of God. Likewise, we must speak, however, the truth in love, not out of hatred, not out of bitterness and resentment, yelling at the top of our lungs, insulting someone by the manner in which we do so. We must speak the truth in love for one another. The commandment of the Lord, yes, must be obeyed. Otherwise, we are simply being hypocritical in calling Jesus our Lord. Jesus says in Luke 6, 46, Why call ye me Lord, Lord, and do not the things which I say? Paul and Barnabas Two heroes of the early church had a sharp personal disagreement that led to each going in a different direction, down a different path of ministry within the same visible church. What can we learn from the Holy Spirit, from what the Holy Spirit has here included in this portion of Acts 15? that is important in considering in all of our relationships. Considering the, the disagreements, the personal disagreements, considering how we ought to seek peace in the family, at work, and particularly in the church.
The main points from our text this Lord's Day are the following. Number one, the content of the personal disagreement between Paul and Barnabas in Acts 15, verses 36 through 38. The second main point, the result of the personal disagreement between Paul and Barnabas in Acts 15, verses 39 through 41. Our first main point then, the content of the personal disagreement between Paul and Barnabas in Acts 15, verses 36 through 38. And some days after, Paul said unto Barnabas, Let us go again and visit our brethren in every city where we have preached the word of the Lord and see how they do. And Barnabas determined to take with them John, whose surname was Mark. And Paul thought not good to take him with them, who departed from them from Pamphylia and went not with them to the work. <clears throat> Is it not just like the enemy to look for an opportunity to divide close brethren after these very brethren have fought in the same trenches against the onslaught of false teachers and have been united in the first Presbyterian Synod that met in Jerusalem in order to confirm the true gospel of Jesus Christ. You see, a great peace prevailed in the church in removing the sinister doctrine of works righteousness, and likewise a great joy uh, as well overwhelmed the hearts of those Gentile believers who received the report and the letter, the verbal report and the actual letter that was sent by the Senate of Jerusalem to these various Gentile believers and churches. And in that letter, as we noted last Lord's Day, these false teachers were censured that promoted a justification by faith plus works. And the Gentile believers to whom these letters were sent, they were also uh, told to ab abstain from all idolatrous associations in order to avoid offense to themselves and to avoid offense to others. In verses 23 through 29, Acts 15. Paul and Barnabas had gone through so much together. Quite the team. Barnabas, the son of consolation, introduced Paul and stood with him when many in the church of Jerusalem feared that Paul's conversion was a mere charade in order to gain access to the church in Jerusalem in order to destroy it in Acts 9 verses 26 through 27. Barnabas, the son of consolation, was the one who realized his need of Paul's help and who left Antioch and went to Tarsus where, where Paul lived in order to call Paul to minister alongside him, alongside Barnabas in teaching and preaching in the church of Antioch as we saw in Acts 11. Verses 25 through 26. There was here was a team that had prevailed through all of the persecution of the first missionary journey to Cyprus and to the cities of Galatia. And this same team stood together at the Synod of Jerusalem in defending justification by faith alone in Jesus Christ alone. But after all this toil and persecution and standing together in the truth, the enemy torpedoes this team, dividing them over a personal 
disagreement. You see, dear ones, it's tragic. It's tragic when it happens. It breaks the heart of, of, of all of us to see what happens here between Paul and Barnabas. You know, we should not casually or quickly pass over what happened here. The Holy Spirit has included this for our instruction in his word. And dear ones, if it could happen to Paul and Barnabas, it can happen to you. It can happen to you in your marriage or mine. It can happen in your relationship with the brethren, with your brethren or mine. Never take the peace that you have with your husband or wife, with your children or with your parents, with your brothers and sisters in Christ. Never take it that peace for granted. For at any time, the enemy is just waiting for the right opportunity to divide and conquer. As we see here, even mature Christians in the faith and leaders in the church will be targeted with such severe disagreements that they will no longer walk down the same road together. Let us look more closely at personal disagreements or at this personal disagreement that led Paul and Barnabas down different paths. After the synod in Jerusalem had concluded and Paul and Barnabas had returned to the church of Antioch to continue their ministry together there, a relatively short period of time passed while they taught and preached together with many other ministers the Lord had raised up there in Antioch. Paul proposed to Barnabas a plan to revisit the, the churches in Galatia uh, uh, that they had established in their first missionary journey in Acts 15, 36. You see, Paul had his sights uh, always on expanding the borders of the kingdom. He was the apostle to the Gentiles and having planted new churches on the island of Cyprus and in the province of Galatia, his heart burned. His heart burned to know how these new churches were faring, how these brethren were standing up against the assaults of the enemy. You remember I, I noted <clears throat> that the epistle, the letter to the Galatians, was written after the first missionary journey had concluded, and Paul and Barnabas were back uh, in Antioch. And before, however, the synod at Jerusalem had occurred. And in that letter, Paul is writing to those churches of Galatia, the very ones they planted, encouraging them to be steadfast against the false teachers that were also bringing into those churches the same teaching that was brought into Antioch, that we are justified by faith plus works. And so here, Paul has sent this letter to these churches of Galatia, but it's been a while uh, uh, since he has he hasn't written another one. Whether they responded or not, we, we don't have any information to that effect. And so he wants to visit. He wants to see how they're doing, whether they have withstood the attacks of these false teachers. He wants to communicate to them the, the decision that was rendered by the Senate of Jerusalem. He wants to see whether the elders that they appointed in those churches are leading, are feeding, are guiding, are standing steadfast as well. You see, Paul had 
a father's heart for his spiritual children. He yearned to see their growth and their progress in Jesus Christ. And so he proposed this visit, a revisit to these new churches in order to confirm them in the faith and to exhort them to perseverance. After the proposal, there arose a, a major disagreement between Paul and Barnabas as to whether John Mark should accompany them once again, as he did the first missionary journey, at least at the outset of that missionary journey, but subsequently deserted them and returned to Jerusalem. Barnabas very much wanted John Mark to join them. Paul just as passionately resisted Barnabas on this proposal as we see in Acts 15 verses 37 through 38. You recall that John Mark was a, a relative of Barnabas, um, Colossians 4.10. And as I said, had initially accompanied Paul and Barnabas on their first missionary journey as far as Cyprus. But when they sailed from Cyprus to the city of Perga in Pamphylia, John Mark left Paul and Barnabas and returned to Jerusalem, according to Acts 13.13. 13. Whether John Mark <clears throat> became fearful of what lay ahead, or found the hardships that they had already endured to be too difficult, or was heavy with the homesickness, or was jealous over the position of chief spokesman that Paul seemed to have assumed over his relative Barnabas, we don't know. But what we do know is that he did leave them. He deserted Paul and Barnabas and returned to Jerusalem. Now Barnabas was of a mind, being known as the son of consolation. Barnabas was of a mind to give John Mark another chance to prove himself faithful in persevering in the face of hardships. And no doubt the fact that they were related likewise moved Barnabas to insist on John Mark joining them. Perhaps Barnabas had seen significant growth in John Mark. Perhaps John Mark had promised that he would never desert them again. Whether Barnabas was more moved by regard to his family relationship or more, more moved by believing the best about John Mark's commitment to persevere this time regardless of the trials they would face along the way, Paul was not moved at all to have John Mark join them again on the second missionary journey. Paul resisted as strongly in one direction as Barnabas did in the opposite direction. Paul thought it unwise to have someone join them who only three to four years ago had abandoned them and abandoned the gospel ministry that was that was being set forth for the comforts of home. For Paul, the rigors and dangers of this missionary journey were not the training ground for young and experienced novices. They needed a proven and a tried man of godly experience and faithful perseverance who would stay the course regardless of what the enemy sent against them, the attacks that would come against them, regardless of what they may face. There was just too much at stake in the work of the Lord to insist upon giving John Mark another chance at that particular stage of John Mark's life. Now, I can see an argument to be made from the side of Barnabas 
who sees growth in John Mark, and being the son of consolation, wants to give him another chance to prove himself. But I can also see an argument to be made from the side of Paul, who sees the importance of the work to require an experienced man of godliness and courage who will not abandon the work because it gets too difficult or too hard along the way. This was a personal disagreement between two saintly heroes of the faith and of the early church who had both risked their lives for the Lord Jesus Christ and his truth. In the very letter that was sent by the, the Senate in Jerusalem, that point is made very clear about Paul and Barnabas when the, in that letter they state, Men, speaking of Paul and Barnabas, men that have hazarded their lives for the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Neither one was willing to back down. Both were committed to their own personal judgment in this particular case. This is not a disagreement over doctrine. They both embrace the same apostolic doctrine and held the same terms of communion. This was not a disagreement over the, over the application of that doctrine. This was not a disagreement over mere preferences. Otherwise, they would have sacrificed those preferences in order to move beyond this disagreement. This was a disagreement over a decision with serious consequences to their ministry as to the practical qualifications of John Mark to accompany them. This is likewise, dear ones, by way of application, this is likewise a decision that ministers and elders are called to make many times with regard to candidates for office in the church. It is not always their orthodoxy that is at issue or their ability to teach and to preach that is at issue, or their faithfulness in their marriage that is at issue. But it may be whether there is evidence of that kind of constancy, patience, love for the brethren, steadfastness in the face of opposition and hardships in the ministry. It's fairly typical for young men to have a rather rosy and idealistic and romantic, as it were, perception and view of the ministry, forgetting the fact that to be a faithful minister or a steadfast elder is like painting a bullseye on your backside for the world and even for the church to use as target practice. Sometimes it means Young men will resent you, leave you, and find a church that will ordain them over a decision to delay or to abstain altogether. There was no doubt all faithful ministers and elders still have much room in which to grow once they are ordained to office. But knowing the ups and the downs of the ministry, we must, we must seek to draw the curtains back and to expose any romantic ideas any man has about serving in an office of the church of Jesus Christ. This is not to discourage you. It's simply to say you need to understand what you're getting into before you accept an office and swear that you will uphold that office before Jesus Christ. It's intended to caution you to approach such holy offices with reverence, with diligence, faithfulness, and perseverance you will need in order that you do not abandon those who look to you within the congregation, who look to you for strength, 
for courage, for godliness under pressure, and for perseverance even when you feel like giving up. Men must first, dear ones, be proven and tried before they are thrust into both the blessings and the unique trials of the ministry, whatever office they may hold, whether a minister, an elder, or a deacon. That's why Paul says in 1 Timothy 3.10, he's speaking with regard to de deacons, but if, if, if this is true of deacons, it's true of ministers and elders as well. Let these also first be proved. This was, dear ones, the content of the disagreement between Paul and Barnabas. Let's move on to the second main point. The result of the personal disagreement between Paul and Barnabas in Acts 15, verses 39 through 41. And the contention was so sharp between them that they departed asunder one from the other. And so Barnabas took Mark and sailed unto Cyprus. And Paul chose Silas and departed, being recommended by the brethren unto the grace of God. And he went through Syria and Cilicia, confirming the churches. The first result of this personal disagreement was that a sharp contention, not a mild disagreement, a sharp contention divided them. The word here for sharp contention, paroxysmos, paroxysm, is the English uh, uh, word, paroxysm, which refers to a, a convulsion, something sharp that happens uh, medically uh, very often with regard to pain or uh, or, or the spread of a disease. Here's an emotional or verbal outburst from these heroes of the faith toward one another. Their emotions got the better of them in this disagreement. On the one hand, we know Paul and Barnabas were men of like passions with us. They even said so in Acts 14, 15, as, they, as the... Uh, uh, Heathen, the Gentiles within that city were uh, wanting to make uh, offer sacrifices to them, and and they rend their garments and say, "See, we're we're men of like passions with you. We're just men. We're not gods." However, on the other hand, we tend to put these men who say they are like passions with us. We tend to put them on such a pedestal that we may overlook their sins or weaknesses. <clears throat> Paul doesn't seem to hide his temptations that he faces with regard to lust in Romans chapter 7, for example, which he calls concupiscence, sexual lust. He doesn't hide that. He, he mentions that that was a temptation to him. But by God's grace, by God's power, through the res, uh, death and resurrection of Jesus Christ, he could account himself dead dead to sin, but alive to Jesus Christ. I certainly do not rejoice in this division between Paul and Barnabas, but I do rejoice to know that I am not alone in keeping my emotions under control of the Holy Spirit. They as well had to work in controlling their emotions. They needed to grow in the fruit of temperance or self-control as I need to grow in the fruit of temperance or self-control. No doubt they were miles ahead of me, but they still needed to grow. So let us not minimize what happened here. It was a hot, emotional, verbal, personal disagreement between two godly apostles in the New Testament church. It was not a disagreement, as I said, about doctrine. 
It was not a disagreement over an immoral life. It was a personal disagreement over an important practical decision of who would join them in their missionary, on their missionary team. And wow, did they disagree. That was the first result. The second result of this strong personal disagreement was that neither Paul nor Barnabas would back away from their strong views on the subject. And so they were divided and divided and each went his separate way. Barnabas taking Mark with him to Cyprus and Paul taking Silas, a tried and a proven a man of God. Uh, he was one of the men that the church or that the Synod of Jerusalem, you remember, sent to Antioch to carry the message because it says he was one of the chief men in the church of Jerusalem. Here was a tried, a proven man uh, who, who had withstood the persecution that the Jews had brought against the church in Jerusalem. There also seems to be here in verse uh, 30, I'm sorry, in verse 40, the Church of Antioch, likely through its presbytery, recommended Paul and Silas, that is commended officially, commended Paul and Silas to the grace of God in their missionary trip upon which they were about to uh, embark. In Acts 15 40 it specifically says that 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 they recommended them to the grace of God but no mention is made of such a recommendation on the part of Barnabas and Mark being sent with that commendation official commendation no further mention of Barnabas is made in the rest of of the book of Acts. Book of Acts primarily uh, from that from this point on is uh, has Paul in the spotlight while the ministry of Barnabas seems to fade doesn't mean that it actually faded but it seems to fade within the pages of scripture. As I close today, I, I want to uh, challenge you with what we can glean from the lives of Paul and Barnabas, what we can glean from this disagreement for our own lives with regard to sharp disagreements, with regard to these personal disagreements that arise in our homes, in our marriage, that arise in the church, that arise in, at work. First of all, <clears throat> sharp personal disagreements might come even among godly and mature Christians and leaders over which course of action might be best and most profitable under the present set of circumstances. There may be disagreement on what direction to take. And in such cases, there may not even be any sin associated with any of the options that are considered. But in all such circumstances, before we allow, dear ones, those to become such sharp disagreements and, and become divisive in sending brethren in opposite directions, let us consider the following steps. First, carefully and prayerfully weigh the options, all the options. Be fair, be honest, weigh all, consider all. 
don't just immediately put down someone else's uh, the option that is suggested. Weigh it out carefully. Second, earnestly pray for peace. Earnestly pray for peace. Don't just, again, put your head down and just, you know, just say, this is the way it's going to be. Pray for peace first. Pray that God would grant, before this becomes divisive, that God would heal, that God would, by his mercy and grace, bring peace out of the situation. Third, control the emotions and the words don't get defensive. Set a guard over your mouth. Pray that God shows forth the fruit of temperance and self-control in your life. Fourth, speak the truth in love. Don't speak the truth with an air of, I'm better than you, I'm smarter than you. Don't speak the truth with an air of, I control this situation. Speak the truth in love. Love means that you care for that person. You want what's best. For that person even if that person disagrees with you you want what's best and you want peace but it is important to speak the truth if there is truth to be known we don't hide the truth we don't bury the truth we don't conceal the truth it's important that we do speak the truth but that we speak the truth in love And fifth, if the options are not sinful in themselves, ask, is it possible to reach a compromise on this disagreement? Is it possible to reach some place where we can depart, not as, as having the severe disagreement, not as causing a division? Is there some way to be able to bring about a compromise without sacrificing the truth? Or is it my way or the highway? Again, must I always be right? Must I always be in control? Is that how we approach these types of situations? And finally, the last step to consider if, sin, if sinful anger, resentment, or bitter words have been spoken, don't wait to humbly repent and seek forgiveness. The longer the wait, the more likely the resentment and the bitterness will grow. Dear ones, the best of men are men at best. Paul's words Paul's words in 1 Corinthians 9, 6, uttered some four to five years later, indicate that Paul and Barnabas were reconciled and enjoyed brotherly fellowship. They had worked through it. For Paul, in 1 Corinthians chapter 9, in talking about the liberty that we have as Christians, talks about the liberty that he had as an apostle to take a wife or not to take a wife, but he chose not to take a wife because he was so set upon the kind of ministry God had called him to, that to care for a family, he didn't see how he could balance both. Or the liberty that he had to, to be supported by the congregations to whom he ministered, or, the, or on the other hand, to supplement his income by way of, of, a, of, a, of employment as a tent maker. And in this liberty 
that was granted to him, he chose not to work. I mean, he chose not to be employed outside of the, uh, 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 he cho chose not to simply receive uh, from the uh, congregation his support, but he chose to work by way of tent making. And he says in 1 Corinthians 9, 6, that this was the attitude and practices of Barnabas as well. He says, or I only and Barnabas have not we power to forbear working? He lumps himself together with, with Barnabas. There's no animosity. There's no criticism. He's saying, Barnabas, like myself, views that there are times, and Paul did receive from other churches contributions and offerings, but from Corinth, he chose not to. He didn't want to, in that particular situation, be accused of fleecing the flock or just doing this for his own personal gain. And because apparently his uh, apostleship was, was so questioned by those in Corinth, he chose to show and demonstrate that this was his heart, that he would even not receive the support of the people if that meant if that meant that it would become an offense to others that he would work as a tent maker to supply his own needs and he says Barnabas was willing to do the same and so here we find again I believe uh, a, a, a kind of an implication an inference here that that they had been reunited he speaks of, uh, approvingly of Barnabas Another gleaning from this account, a second gleaning from this account. Though Paul was recommended by the church of Antioch, and apparently Barnabas was not, Barnabas did not go off to start his own independent church separate from the apostolic church. Nor is this an example of them being divided. It's not an example uh, of promoting toleration uh, of doctrine and worship or church government contrary to scripture or sound confessions of faith. They did not depart believing anything differently as to the truth. There's no toleration of sin. This was a, a, a strong disagreement that sent them the other in opposite directions. But at the same time, Barnabas was not an independent. He didn't go out and start his own church. He maintained the unity of Christ's church in one doctrine, worship and church government. And he continued his work of building the same apostolic church of Jesus Christ that Paul was likewise building. In different fields, yes, but the same church. Though Paul would seem to have the limelight, Barnabas did not become defensive and tear down the work of Paul. Many people, dear ones, leave churches over damaged relationships rather than over unsound doctrine and corrupt worship. This ought not to be. Our commitment to Jesus Christ and his truth ought to be more important to us than any personal relationship that has been damaged. And faithfulness to a faithful church that is upholding the truth of Jesus Christ should take precedence over any relationship that may have been damaged. Barnabas didn't start his own church. He didn't go to a different church. He continued in the one church, one apostolic church of Jesus Christ. A third gleaning. Family relationships within the church may cloud our thinking in doing what is right or what is best when conflicts and disagreements arise within the church. As may have happened here between Paul and Barnabas, 
the relationship between Barnabas and John Mark may have indeed clouded Barnabas's judgment. I ask your own, will blood be thicker than what is best? Will blood be more influential in our lives than the truth of Jesus Christ? Will loyalty to family be stronger than loyalty to Christ and his truth? Are we willing to sacrifice all things in order to follow Jesus Christ and to be faithful to him and to his truth? A fourth gleaning. Although the enemy designed to destroy the effective service of Paul and Barnabas by way of this sharp contention, God, on the other hand, designed it to increase the spread of the gospel twofold by Paul and Silas going in one direction of ministry and by Barnabas and Mark going in the another direction of ministry and service in the church of Jesus Christ. Though I am close to coming and being brought to tears by this division between these two great men of God, I am nevertheless lifted up in hope and in comfort that my God is so great and so mighty that he even works such divisions out for the good of those who love him and are the called according to his purpose. According to Romans 8.28, Satan tried to bring a rift and what happened Instead of one missionary team, there were two. The fifth leaning. Mark. John Mark, sometimes called Marcus, sometimes called Mark. This, this young man whom Paul believed was not ready to join their team for lack of maturity or experience or perseverance. This same man became a very able and capable minister of Jesus Christ, no doubt under the tutelage to a great extent of Barnabas. To such an extent, dear ones, that at the end of Paul's life, One of the, the, the last requests on the part of the Apostle Paul before he was beheaded, he didn't know when it was going to happen, but before he was martyred, and he knew it was soon, he says in 2 Timothy 4.11, only Luke is with me. Take Mark and bring him with thee. For he is profitable to me for the ministry. He is profitable to me for the ministry. Can you fail and yet be used mightily by the Lord? Absolutely. As was Mark. There was no Christian is beyond recovery. If you have fallen, here is hope for you and for your recovery and usefulness in the kingdom of Jesus Christ. Never give up. Never give up. This is the same mark that the Holy Spirit even used to give us the gospel of Mark. What an encouragement, dear ones, that out of conflict, out of disagreement, God is able to teach us, to train us, and to use us.
for his glory. You see, dear ones, that is the gospel of Jesus Christ. The Lord, upon saving us, never gives up. We cannot give up because he never gives up for his own. He will never give up on you. Christ takes even the chief of sinners, the Apostle Paul, and saves him and turns the arch persecutor of the church into the Apostle Paul who loves the church of Jesus Christ and is willing to sacrifice his life that the gospel of Jesus Christ might go forward. Dear ones, trust in Jesus Christ. Take him now, dear friend. Take him as your savior. Embrace, embrace everlasting life, the forgiveness of sin, justification by faith alone. Embrace heaven through Jesus Christ. Come to him. He is able and will make all that is ugly into that which is beautiful in his time. Amen. Stand with me in prayer. Our gracious God and Father, we praise thee and thank thee for thy word, for thy faithfulness. We praise thee, our Lord, that thou hast included this account in the Holy Scriptures, that, Lord, we might be challenged as to how we go around so often uh, uh, starting, beginning, uh, wallowing into these strong disagreements, perhaps when it's not even necessary. And, Lord, we, we pray that thou would give to us a heart that fights for peace more than more than fights for uh, our own uh, so-called rights. We pray, Father, causes to be those who love Jesus Christ and his kingdom more than the kingdom of this world. We're willing to lay down our lives for the brethren. who are willing to lay down our lives for the truth of Jesus Christ. <laughs> Build up thy kingdom, O God. Begin with us. Begin in our families. May we be those who are not setting more and more obstacles that hinder peace, setting them up in our family, but, O God, that we would be those who are trying to tear them down one after another in our personal relationships, in the family, work, and in the church of Jesus Christ. Hear our prayers, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. <laughs>
are in that atmosphere of peace. May we derive likewise that peace in whatever we're going through from him. We'll be using the tune Retreat. Da 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 da. Let me start. Da da da. Okay. I all day long am made a scorn. I all day long am made a scorn. Reproached by my malicious foes. Reproached by my malicious foes. The madmen are against me sworn. The madmen are against me sworn. The men against me that arose. The men against me that arose. For I have ashes eaten up. For I have ashes eaten up to me as if they had been bred. To me as if they had been bred, and with my drink I in my cup, and with my drink I in my cup, of bitter tears a mixture made. Of a bitter tears a mixture Because thy wrath was not appeased. Because thy wrath was not appeased. And dreadful indignation and dreadful indignation. Therefore it was that thou me raised. Therefore it was that thou me raised. And thou again didst cast me down. And thou again didst cast me down. My days are like a shade alway. My days are like a shade alway, which doth declining swiftly pass. Which does decline pass, and I am withered away, and I am withered away, much like unto the fading grass. Much like unto the fading grass. But thou, O Lord, shalt still endure. But thou, O Lord, shalt still endure. From change and all mutation free. From change and all mutation free, and to all generations sure, and to all generations sure, shall thy remembrance ever be. Shall thy remembrance ever be? 
Please stand with me and receive the benediction of the Lord our God from Psalm 121, verses 5 through 8. The Lord is thy keeper, the Lord is thy shade upon thy right hand. The sun shall not smite thee by day, nor the moon by night. The Lord shall preserve thee from all evil. He shall preserve thy soul. The Lord shall preserve thy going out and thy coming in from this time forth and even forevermore. Amen. You are dismissed.